We are very excited to put together this roundtable because it's uh, regional aid equality is an issue that the UK has such a special um, history and situation with. We have a large inequality between different parts of the UK um, where you know, some parts do better than some of the most developed countries in the world, and some are more at the level of the Czech Republic and Slovenia. And one of the reasons uh, that is often being discussed for this regional inequality is how power is distributed across levels of governance. Um, the UK has a very strong central government, and the vast majority of taxes collected goes to central governments, which leads to a situation where local councils have to compete for competitive brands and spend roughly 2.25 million per year on that process uh, with this competitive nature. And so how that affects the local level and what the local level can do to, um, to tackle inequality is a really fascinating topic. We have uh, two larger issues that we wanna to bring to this round table. One is the Northeast Evolution Deal and we have two fascinating um, speakers that will um, be discussing this deal. On the one hand, Alexandra Jarvis, who's head of the Northeast area team in the cities and local growth unit of the UK government. And from the local level, Mark Stamper, who's the principal innovation and economy manager of the North Italian Command Authority. And then the other thing that is really interesting to us is what leveling up means at the local level, how it affects local authorities, what opportunities and challenges there are. And on this topic, we are going to hear Adam Hawksby, the Deputy Director of Onward, and Councillor Jason Brooke, the leader of Reading Borough Council, who has been involved in the local government associations leveling up locally in Cree. And with that, I would love to hand over to Alexandra Jarvis and look forward to her presentation. Thank you. Um, I think Henriette used the word fascinating there when she just introduced me and I'll very much try to live up to that but I'm not sure that I will so you can forgive us if I don't. Um, I'm going to share my screen with a few slides. So I am going to talk to you a little bit um, today about the Northeast Devolution Deal. Um, so I, as Henriette said, work in the Cities and Local Growth Unit. Um, for anyone who doesn't know what that is, we are a unit of government that sits in both the Department of um, Business and Trade and the Department of Leveling Up. Uh, so we work in both of those departments, two sets of ministers, two sets of priorities, um, and we look at things from a local growth perspective. So my job essentially is to, um, I'm not a policy expert in any one specific area, but my job is to really understand the place. Uh, so when I talk about the Northeast, I'm talking about it um, from Northumberland down to Durham, so I don't cover the Tees Valley. Um, and my role, yeah, is to is to really understand the place, understand its opportunities, its challenges, its geography, and be able to feed that information back into government to help inform policy making and ministerial advice and, and that sort of thing. Um, so just before I get onto the actual deal, I just wanted to quickly talk a little bit about um, where, where the sort of push for devolution deals has come from most recently. So if I can just take you back a little bit to the level of white paper, which was just over a year ago, um, that really set the tone for how government is now thinking about policy making. Um, being sort of place-based and putting place at the heart of things is, is not a new thing. Um, but I think the level of white paper was a real signal um, very firmly to how government wants to start thinking about things, not in policy silos, but in a way that reflects the fact that all of our social issues and challenges are interconnected. And so we need to think about them in that way. We need to think about them holistically and we need to think about them in a way that puts the place first um, and empowers places to actually be able to tell us what they need um, without a one size fits all sort of policy decision. Um, so I don't have a huge amount of time. And I'm going to try and fit a lot of this into a few minutes, but the new devolution deal comes with a little bit of um, background context. So we already have a devolution deal in the northeast, in the north of the region, which um, is the north of Tyne Combined Authority. And that came about um, with a, a long old history but it came about as part of original devolution talks back in sort of 2015 2016 
and that was with all seven local authorities um, and ended somewhat unsuccessfully in that all seven local authorities did not go ahead with the deal but on the positive note three of them did and we ended up with the north of Tyne combined authority um, which has done some really brilliant work is still very much uh, a new combined authority so it's only I think Jamie was elected in 2019 so it's relatively new still um, but it, it has done a lot of brilliant work and has demonstrated how I think um, how an MCA can really benefit a region um, even in that short space of time. The new deal however I think recognises the fact that actually the North of Tank Combined Authority as brilliant as it is is not the ideal geography. The fact that it's only over half of a region really limits what it can do um, because anyone who knows the region, has spent time in the region, lived or worked there, knows that it, it doesn't just stop at the time. So we live and work across the region as a whole. You might well live in Northumberland and travel to Sunderland every day for work or do all of your socialising in uh, Newcastle but live in South Shields or so it just the region doesn't work in a way that the current governance geography is set up so it was it's not an ideal sort of economic solution um, so the new deal covers all seven of the local authority areas um, and what will happen is the current um, North of Tyne Combined Authority and the current non-mayoral combined authority in the south of the town will cease to exist and the new MCA will be established, um, fingers crossed, May 2024, providing all is well on the implementation. Um, I put a little bit here about what it brings in terms of um, headlines. So there's a £1.4 billion investment fund. Now that's significant, very significant in terms of the wider devolution context because it is the most generous um, investment fund that government has agreed to date um, and there's quite there's a bit of reason for that part of it is because uh, it probably reflects the need in the northeast but one of the bigger reasons is actually um, because we were in such a unique position when negotiating the deal in the northeast in that we already have a deal um, it meant that leaders in the northeast were super clear about their red lines when we began you know what would or wouldn't be acceptable for the region um because if we are if we're going to create something that means um some people are now a slightly smaller fish in a slightly bigger pond it needs to be a deal that is really worthwhile and that will really work and really make an impact and is good for everyone involved so leaders were really, really clear with us from the very beginning about this no detriment policy that they had. So, and that was regarding powers and, and funding. Um, they wouldn't accept anything on a per capita basis that was less than what the current North of Tyne deal was, um, which may have caused some slight headaches, I think, in the Treasury. But actually, it was really clear for us because we knew exactly what we were working with and we knew the goal and it made the negotiation actually in some ways easier because we knew uh, what would or wouldn't be acceptable. Um, some of the things here, so the transport settlements are currently, the north of Tyne doesn't have transport powers um, and it, the transport uh, is, the decisions on transport are made via a joint transport committee across the region. Um, so that's a new a new thing that'll come with the deal. Expansion of the adult education budget to reflect the new geography, expansion of Brownfield Housing Fund to reflect the new geography. Um, there's a 20 million regen fund. Um, and then it also comes with borrowing powers um, and various other sort of softer commitments from government as well. Um, when I mentioned the, the softer commitments, I think it's really important when we're talking about devolution and the opportunities that it can bring to remember that it actually isn't just about money so while while the money is great and there's some real benefits that comes with that uh, which i'll get onto in a minute it's not just about the money i think there are some real um advantages to the softer commitments within the deal and if if any of you've actually read the northeast devolution deal there is a lot of stuff in there that I think sometimes people can undervalue a little bit and think, you know, this is 
it, it doesn't really mean anything, but there are a lot of commitments in there from government to work with the region on quite specific sort of economic priorities. So some of that being around um, like unlocking the potential of the Tyne and really attracting more investment and um, really helping the place to grow based on the assets and the opportunities that it already has. And I think people can sometimes, um, yeah, sometimes undervalue a little bit the the real strength that is in the the text on a page that is published and public um, that says, you know, we agree to working with you on this. So there are quite a lot of commitments in there around that sort of stuff, around skills as well, um, which I think it's important to recognise. But the other thing that I think uh, it brings in addition to the money is um, it it reunites that, that functional economic area. So as I said before, um, the region doesn't stop at the time. And so creating this new MCA across this bigger geography will A, be able to really take the good things about North of Tyne and what they've started and expand that. So what are the things that actually have worked really well and how can we roll them out further across the region so that it works for everywhere else as well? Um, and it also, I think, really lends itself better to partnership working. So um having everything almost sort of under the one roof if you like and I'm really oversimplifying there and I, I'm not suggesting in any way that this new MCA will mean that local councils you know are less important or our work with them is less important but just to to make the point and illustrate it to have everything sort of together and under that one roof and under that one structure it really helps in being able to navigate through both government working with uh, the local area, but also the local area working with its partners in the region, so i.e. Um, institutions like universities or with private sector, having everything there in that one place just, just really helps that conversation. It helps with accountability in terms of, um, again, the local area being accountable to its constituents, but also um, being accountable to government as well. It creates a, a more clear structure for accountability. Um, and it also helps, I think one of the key things that I really find um, or that I think is going to be a real opportunity for the North East coming from this deal is um, the ability to be able to think in a, in a way that is strategic and is long term. So it removes this barrier of um, single pots of money here and there and competitive bidding process and that uncertainty of when money might be coming or if it's coming, um, thinking from sort of spend and review to spend and review, it removes a lot of that. And it means that the region can now think, OK, we can we can look across the whole region, uh, that whole functional economic area, and we can really start to think now about what is our plan for the next 30 years, because there's some continuity there and there's some stability there. Um, which I think without the MCA across that area, was a, it is a little bit lacking. It, it exists in the north of town, but it doesn't exist in the rest of the region. Um, so I think that's one of the other things that is a real opportunity for the northeast here. Um, and I think when you think about uh, sort of, there's a whole debate to be had about whether devolution in its current form is, is devolution or, or it's not. But when you think about... Um, the purpose of devolution, whether or not you think it's, you know, how you measure its success, a lot of that it isn't about actually is this a good deal in terms of the money, it's about the outcomes that will come and I think the best way to, to get the best outcomes is really A, through time because then these are really long-standing challenging issues that haven't happened overnight um, and they're not going to be solved overnight and B, through um, through having all the relevant people round the table and sort of singing from the same hymn sheet, like we're all connected, we all uh, know, know each other, we can communicate our own issues together and develop a plan that is long-term, that is more stable, um, and that allows us to really think about the trajectory away from this sort of, you know, a few years here, a few years there, a few years you know, later on and sort of removed a little bit from that almost political instability as well. 
which can be a real challenge for places when thinking about um, particularly regeneration um, and some of those longer term issues. Alex, thank you so much for that. And we'll now hear from Mark Stamper, who's the Principal Innovation and Economy Manager in the North of Time Combined Authority. So looking forward to hearing you, Mark. And as well, if everyone, please put your comments and questions for our panel in the chat and we'll get to that in the Q&A afterwards. So Mark, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks for that, Alex, and uh, thanks for that, Jeremy. So I'm, I'm Mark Stump, a, prim, a Principal Innovation Economy Manager at the North of Tyne. Um, we, we were joking in the uh, in the holding area before we came in as to whether my presentation would be radically and diametrically opposed to what Alex was going to say about um, Northeast devolution. I think you'll find it probably isn't, um, thankfully, uh, that that um, different in sentiment. But I think given given the I suppose given the the brief and the context of, of of whether devolution can combat some of the some of the spatial inequality you know within and, and between regions. I think it's probably worth just setting a bit of local context in terms of what that what that means for us. Um, particularly in the north of Tyne, as Alex says, my current role within the current Merrill Combined Authority, but increasingly as well with the North of Tyne, uh, with the wider northeast devolution. As, as a region, we're a very diverse region we typically you know talk about that as an asset and an opportunity um but clearly you know it that does come with its challenges um by footprint will be um one of the largest devolved areas in the in the country um in terms of geographical scope um in terms of what that means in in public policy terms you know our residents for one are very geographically diverse we're, we're almost a region of opposites in a number of different ways actually um you have simultaneously um more rural than the national average but have significant pockets of urban um core where a, a disproportionately higher uh, proportion of the of the population live simultaneously um it, deprivation is undeniably a reality for many of our communities uh, as it is across the, the the rest of the uk but um we have a much higher proportion of residents living in the top 20 percent of deprived areas um than than average in their they're both rural and urban areas um in terms of our skills and workforce picture younger people are much more likely to migrate to urban areas from our rural um r rural areas and sort of conversely um people late in, in the later mid to later career are much more likely to move from urban areas to rural areas so we have a real uh, transition in in terms of the workforce to manage and then we've got you know, a mix of hyper connected cities alongside the biggest and least well connected rural county in the country so in terms of public policy um terms that is a real challenge for us to to start to get to grips with um but those spatial inequalities haven't obviously emerged overnight you know the the there's a, a, a well-trodden narrative around transition from our um, former industrial strengths, um, you know, inc including coal mining towns and shipbuilding, et cetera. But there's a new set of drivers around that spatial inequality that um, are probably more technology um, dependent, including connectivity in terms of broadband um, and mobile, but also attitudinal drivers in terms of you know people's wants and desires and you know where they want to live. Um, some of the post-COVID effects that um, that we're all aware of as well. So, yeah, that gives us a bit of context to go on in terms of our, I suppose, our current North of Tyne activity. You know, we've got a current investment program actively investing across the North of Tyne area. Yeah, you know, I think the, the the breadth of policy and investment that's that's happening just at the North of Tyne level, you know, reinforces some of the points around what it takes to do leveling up justice in a, a local area. We've got around about 180 million of investment. Um, and that ranges from schools and child poverty interventions to, you know, to skills and digital inclusion interventions, uh, interventions to support key sector growth, um, innovation, uh, some work around place recovery and high street recovery. Um, inward investment, digital infrastructure and connectivity. And they're, they're just a few different areas that sit within our, our investment portfolio as a primarily an economic actor. Um, that's without any major, you know, um, transport or other, um, other, other social responsibilities. And I think that complexity started to be recognized uh, in a couple of ways, probably by government in, in expanding their place-based deep dive initiatives um of which i think one of the first ones was in in northumberland in blythe uh, i think that program's now 
expanding out across the country as a result of the last spending review. Um, and I think the way that combined authorities have evolved uh, in the short time that the North of Tyne's been in existence, where I've sort of termed this as a, a core investment fund plus model. You know, our, our North of Tyne investment fund is 20 million a year. Since our establishment, that's been augmented with, you know, 20, 25 million of Brownfield Housing Fund, additional delegations from Department for Education around skills interventions um, and, and a number of other uh, fund streams, both competitive and non-competitive that we've acquired along the way. So I think you know, that the ability of combined authorities to manage some of that complexity has been recognised as a part of the, um, the devolution agenda. And I think just to echo Alex's point, I think you know it's clear that when you look at the complexity across those policy um, initiatives, um, you, you can't deliver the multitude of, of complementary interventions in a place that are needed through a competitive bidding cycle. You, know, you, you couldn't guarantee getting one or two of the, the list that I've you know, just been through, never mind the you know, eight or ten of them focused in, in the right way at the right time. Um, so I think just sort of finally, in terms of that contextual piece, as a combined authority, as with government through the level and up agenda, I think we recognise that we need to have a differentiated impact on places. Um, and just because we're devolved at a level of North of Tyne or devolved, devolved at the level of the North East, that doesn't mean that our policy interventions can be placed blind either. Um, you know, a big part of the role of combined authorities, I think, is is managing that diversity at a local level at a level that's arguably much more manageable than, you know, than a UK government level. And I think that's where some of the strength of, um, of, of, of our opportunity comes through, you know, mm. being able to co-design and be properly reflective of, of local needs. And in some cases doing that with and through our local authorities, you know, devolution again is not about taking responsibility up from local authorities. It's about greater responsibility at a local level and greater resources at a local level. Um, so just in the last sort of minute or so, um, I just want to reflect on what the North of Tyne might tell us about what we need to do at a northeast level, accepting that you know there's still a bit of um, a bit of sort of design work to go into that. But the, I think the first point Alex has made, I want to reiterate uh, to in too much detail about the comparative deal size of the northeast. You know, it's it is significant. It is one of the best per capita deals, uh, the best per capita deal in terms of investment. Um, the broader ge broader geography gives us an opportunity to build on a, a greater breadth of assets. You know, double the number of universities, more than double the number of businesses in that geography. Um, it brings more powers and funding, but as Alex has already set out, it, it more importantly, I think, brings a more cohesive policy environment, um, both in terms of the functional geography and the political um, economy of the, of the place as well. Um, and I think transport is probably one of the, the most significant additional levers that we'll have um, to try and build on, um, on the, you know, the, the, the inclusive nature of that investment. Um, and then I think finally, main, you know, being able to maintain a strategic focus as we transition from the North of Tyne into um, a northeast devolution deal, and to some extent, that means um, continuing to sort of double down on our strengths and not try and be everything to everyone, um, both in terms of economic strategy and and our investment, but also thinking about building on what works, um, you know, and what has worked and what can be extended and expanded, both from a North of Tyne point of view, but also initiatives at a local level. Um, that that may require the you know the heft and the scale of a combined authority to really you know sort of unlock the the potential benefits of those those approaches. So I'll, I'll finish there, Jeremy. Just conscious of time to to let other speakers in, but hopefully that's a a useful uh, counter to Alex's um, you know, sort of policy position at the front end. No, thank you, Mark. That was great. I think the point about what works is a good one as well. I think people on people on this call who've been involved in other devolution deals maybe want to be involved in a devolution deal. And I think this, I mean, the, this, this event, the knowledge sharing aspect of this event, and because I think it's important in that regards, we can share best practice and insights about kind of things that worked, things that didn't. So thanks again for that. That's great. Um, again, keep your questions coming on devolution, the Northeast deal in particular, or indeed devolution more generally. 
We're now going to zoom out from the northeast a bit and look more at levelling up in the UK as a whole. We have two speakers, Adam Hawksby and Jason Brook. I'll go first to Adam Hawksby, the direct, Deputy Director of Onward. Adam, the floor is yours. Hello, hello. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, as you said, Adam Hawksby, I uh, run a think tank called Onward. We do lots of work on levelling up, on repairing the social fabric in the UK on a range of different topics. Um, I was also previously head of policy at the West Midlands Combined Authority um, as an advisor to Andy Street, um, and so have experience of devolution deals uh, in different parts of the country. Um, I do have some slides that I'm going to run through just to highlight a piece of work we did recently called Leveling Up uh, Locally. The work that we did was to try and understand from the bottom up, from communities upwards, um, what levelling up looked like in practice. What were the levers that are available to local communities, to um, both councils, but also businesses, to community groups, to others. Um, and so we went on a series of uh, visits where we did focus groups, where we had conversations with some of those leaders. Um, these are three of the case studies we produced from Oldham, South Tyneside and Walsall. We also went to uh, Clacton in Essex, we went to Barry in South Wales, uh, and some other visits, places like Barnstable in South Devon and elsewhere. And all of this was to bring together um, a, a, some analysis, what are the common challenges in these places that underpin some of the spatial inequalities that, that Alex and Mark describe, some of those kind of macro-regional um, inequalities. And um, what sort of data do we need to understand these problems, and then what interventions might help to uh, address them. So I'm just going to run through quickly now where we got to. And the first thing to say is that underpinning some of these really big trends in these spatial inequalities, we found five common challenges when you ask people, uh, whether they're members of the public or others, what do you think needs to happen to level up your area? And so you can see here the two dimensions that came up most regularly. On the left, on the economy, all of these left behind areas were both struggling in terms of their GVA, their productivity, that's the y-axis on that left graph, and their um, gross disposable household income, the kind of level of uh, household welfare, that's on the x-axis on those left graph. All of those areas that we visited in that bottom left quadrant. Um, but then also in terms of the strength of society, of their community, um, on would have produced a thing called the Social Fabric Index. It's a, an indicator that looks at the strength of communities and of society. All of the areas we looked at were uh, below average in terms of the strength of their social fabric. That's the uh, x-axis on that right-hand graph. And then on belonging, when you ask people just in a, in a survey to what degree do you feel a sense of belonging in your area, most areas in that bottom left, so below average, but you actually find that in the UK areas in the Midlands and the North, uh, individuals are more likely to say they feel like they belong uh, to their community. So while Oldham and South Tyneside are higher, both of them are lower than their regional averages to the northwest and the northeast um, respectively. So what did we find? One, um, something that is very rarely talked about in the levelling up debate is, is crime and antisocial behaviour. Um, that's partly because it's um, something that is kind of most prominent at the street level when you're kind of a member of the public living in these areas. Um, and when we went to do our focus groups, the number one thing people said was, um, my area is struggling because I don't feel confident going out to shop or I can't take advantage of the new tram or I can't commute because I don't want to be coming home late at night. Um, I can't go to a football game anymore because I wouldn't want to walk around when we went to Oldham around um, uh, Oldham Athletics around the Latex Stadium. So what we've got here is some, when we did all these visits, we tried to back this up with data and found that in all of the areas we went to public order offences, how you would manage or how you would record uh, some of these things had massively spiked in areas that were um, left behind, uh, even though the average had gone up across the rest of the UK, it was particularly notable in these areas. So crime, antisocial behaviour um, is both a symptom, importantly, and a cause of some of these spatial inequalities and a balance of prevention um, and uh, kind of tackling these things when they occur is really important. And the second one, uh, high streets and town centres. So again, um, not necessarily. If you were looking to boost the productivity of the Northeast as a whole, you wouldn't just focus on high streets and town centres. Um, but when you ask people day to day, why do they feel like their area is uh, behind? Why do they feel a, a lack of pride in their area? Why do they feel people are moving away to take advantage of other roles? And um, high streets and town centres often comes up. So here we look at uh, vacancy rates on a high street, enormously high in the areas we went to, and also how many independent businesses there are well below UK averages. And this has a huge emotional resonance in the places that we went to. 
The third one was uh, local sport, culture, heritage and green space. Lots of the work that's been done on why there is a um, political volatility in um, left behind parts of the UK is that sense that um, areas have lost a sense of pride or rather that people might be proud of the area but feel like others aren't giving it the due that it's worth. A lot of that rooted we found in sport, culture, heritage, the thing that gives an area meaning and clacked and it was the pier in South Tyneside, the town hall was something that people felt their area was uh, was a real strength in their area. In Oldham, it was football. In Walsall, it was the Arboretum. If you spend time in areas, you will find those individual things that give people a sense of meaning and identity, and too often they are overlooked. So here we've just got a couple of indicators of that. On the left, the number of people that participate in arts and culture, in the areas we went to below English averages, and on the right, how many of these assets exist. Again, most of these areas below UK averages. The fourth thing we found is the um, uh, the weakness of the private sector, of the tradable sector in particular. So those parts of the economy that export either to other parts of the UK or internationally. Um, the foundational economy, so that would be bits of the public sector, uh, local restaurants, bars, things that cater to a local population, is often disproportionately large in some of these areas uh, and left behind parts of the country, um, which means that very little new investment and new jobs are coming in and being created. And I think that underpins some of the challenges that Alex and Mark were describing um, need to be tackled by combined authorities, that job creation, that investment promotion um, focus is all about trying to build the tradable economy. What do we have a comparative advantage on that means we can trade with areas outside? So a big thing we focused on was how you would boost that local growth. Um, and then fifth, uh, this kind of title of providing community-based support to the most disadvantaged. Every area we went to, um, local leaders would describe a particular patch or area. So you know, uh, South Shields in South Tyneside was really struggling. It was Gibbons down when we were in Barry. Um, there was always an area where they said, look, in that place, there is multi-generational unemployment, often challenges with um, multiple diagnoses, people with addiction issues, with chronic pain. And that feeds into economic inactivity and other um, kind of social and economic challenges. And often these groups are least amenable to support from the public sector. They are most skeptical of the NHS, of local authorities, you need empowered community groups to tackle some of these inequalities that underpin those broader spatial inequalities. Um, in our report, Leveling Up Locally, we then run into a range of interventions. I'm not going to run through all of these because I'll leave plenty of time for questions. But um, if you do want to talk through these, I'll go through the report. I'm going to flick through those ideas. They are all there. But for now, um, I will I'll leave that and I'll let others chat and then look forward to questions. Thank you. That was great. And I'm looking forward to some discussion of these in the Q&A. Um, we come now to our final speaker before we do that, which is Councillor Jason Brock, who is the leader of Reading Borough Council. And Jason and Adam both contributed to the LGO's Leveling Up Locally Inquiry that Hamid referenced in her introduction. So, Jason, looking forward to your insights before we get to the Q&A. Thank you very much. And I'll, I'll try to be brief to leave time for the Q&A. So, uh, firstly, I should declare that I'm a, a Labour Council leader, so you'll understand that's my frame of reference. I would say that levelling up as a concept, as a piece of political communication, when it first appeared, I thought could potentially be devastatingly effective for the Conservatives. What happened, of course, is that the Conservative uh, councillors in all of the shires said, well, actually, we want a bit of that. And it became broad, it was rendered almost meaningless and it sort of lost its edge but it did become socialized and it is an idea that we talk about all the time now leveling up has just entered local government and national political parlance i'd also declare that in reading we've been lucky enough to receive leveling up funding uh, finance for two projects and we will make good use of that but I am convinced that levelling up, if it is to be successful as a concept, has to be about a lot more than just pots of capital investment. Uh, sort of seed funding for projects, great, you know, wonderful. It'll get big infrastructure over the line. The government's obsessed with shovel ready projects and you know, that's what we can deliver. But if we really want to have successful economic and social change in our communities, we need more than capital investment. We need ongoing revenue funding that allows us to make a success of genuine sort of economic and social change. 
So for, for, from the LGA perspective and through the levelling up inquiry, the conclusion was very much, I suppose, that local leadership is needed to drive levelling up. And local leadership, if we're being candid with one another, is, is uh, inconsistent across the country. The calibre, the quality of local leadership does vary considerably from place to place. And I think as a, a sector, councils need to think about how we provide that. How do we best situate ourselves as systems leaders, uh, not command and control organisations anymore, but system leaders in our places? We also need serious devolution of powers. Uh, personal frustration of mine is that often when we talk about devolution, really what we're talking about is delegation. These decisions are sort of delegated from Westminster to local places, but they still come with so many requirements and criteria that need to be fulfilled. It is not meaningful devolution, meaningful delegation, but it's not meaningful devolution. Uh, Britain, particularly bizarre setup. It seems mad to me that uh, council can take a child into care, but it can't stop a utility provider digging up a pavement. I mean, we, we really do have to have a conversation about the powers that we want local councils to have and look towards, I think, a much more European style model. Finally, the idea of complementary budgeting, uh, partnership budgeting between public service providers, you know, so much money is spent in places by Westminster without any attention consultation with councils and vice versa. You know, we are, we are not consulting Westminster on how we're spending money and we need to find forums where we can have meaningful kind of collaborative budgeting in that way, um, in the sort of way I suppose that the integrated care systems are supposed to bring about in terms of health and social care, but they haven't quite got there yet, a little bit immature perhaps. So closer Whitehall local partnerships would be the summary for that. But the key challenge is that levelling up is not a homogenous issue. Uh, when we look at levelling up, everywhere can do with levelling up. Levelling up is required everywhere, but the challenge itself is not a homogenous one. We have to talk about those inequalities between regions, but also those inequalities within regions and within localities. So if we were to take, for example, Reading and Oldham, you know, Reading, the third most unequal place in England after London and Cambridge, but it's unequal because we have such tremendous economic success and then some people who are unable to share in that. Oldham, on the other hand, is a place that requires much more economic uh, activity and, uh, and growth in order to generate the sort of success uh, that is required. That, uh, so I suppose my point is effectively, we're talking about the challenge in Reading of distribution and inequitable distribution of economic success and in Oldham, the shortage of growth itself. And those are very different challenges. And it's hard to imagine a single set of policy prescriptions is going to cover all of those bases. I think we need to disaggregate this a little bit more. For Reading, it's gonna mean a lot more about skills training, devolution of skills, um, but also the kind of ongoing need to ensure that our economy is sufficiently diverse that it will offer something for everybody in our community. Um, so how does that look? Well, it's a bit difficult when you're a unitary council like us and unable to access on your own those sort of devolution powers. So the natural thing would be to collaborate with our neighbours in Berkshire, seek a devolution deal, but of course different political control in different places makes that challenging. And we return quite often, unfortunately, to a fixation on money. Uh, when I talk to other leaders, the reason they want to talk about devolution is money, 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 but they lack that necessary vision for what we can do with the powers. And I think as a sector, we need to get a lot hotter on that and we need to start articulating our role as local leaders much more clearly, much more forcefully and say to Whitehall, well, actually, there's things we can achieve here and prove ourselves capable of doing so. So that's my sort of uh, reflective takeaway on things. And I'll leave it there so that we can have a bit of time for Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason, for your contribution. That's great. Um, yeah, so questions for our panel on devolution, levelling up and all points in between. If you'd like to go ask a question, please use the hand raise 
functionality and do not be shy. So I'll, I'll go for one for, I guess, for Alex and Mark, coming back to this question that Mark's in about what works. As two people working on a devolution deal or around a devolution deal, do you have particular evidence needs of stuff you don't know yet? Are there things you'd like to know that you don't? Maybe Alex, then Mark. One of the things uh, that, uh, so to, you know, full disclosure, the Northeast deal is the only deal that I've been involved in. Um, so I don't have the context of others, but I think one of the things that actually works really well and worked in favour when negotiating the Northeast deal is because the North of Time already existed, we had quite a lot of evidence as to these are some successes. This is what we've done with this deal. Um, these are some of the successful outcomes that we're starting to see in a relatively like young combined authority. Um, so I think uh, that put us in quite good stead for the new deal for them for for the for the region to be able to say, well, actually, we want we want to do this and we want this because we know that we've started this and this works and we want to be able to expand that. Um, so that would be uh, my reflection. Every everything that we don't know is 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 in essence. Um... I suppose the longer term impact of what we've done over the last three to four years, I think you know, because of the relative infancy of um, combined authorities in the current form and devolution in its current form, a lot of the investment is still inevitably me measured in the, in a similar way to, um, to previous um, programs and projects where it's relatively short term, relatively output and, and short term outcome based. I think the real, unknown is the longer term multiplier effects of of that investment and i think part of the you know part of the challenge in in getting into that long term strategic way of thinking and strategic way of evaluation is is you know contrary to what what we might think with a 30 year devolution deal that doesn't necessarily mean that we're insulated from wider public um policy and political change um you know so while we're you know while we've got relative security over longer term investment and that mayors are democratically elected and not easily re removable other than by stat the statute that created them it doesn't mean that the world doesn't continue to evolve and change around us and that is probably a significant challenge to really understand the um the impact and what works that you, know, you really need to do this in a vacuum for for about 50 years which clearly isn't possible um you know so there's always going to be noise in that picture of in in whatever event great thank you and we have a question from the audience so peter peter Please ask your question. Uh, yes, uh, my interest in transport. Um, uh, I, I live in London, and we have a, a, a system of franchising for buses, which works very well, but it's fairly expensive. Of course, there's been new Transport Act. Local authorities can franchise the bus services. Uh, my question is. Do you think that you're going to have enough money uh, to do that? Because when I look at all these things, and sometimes it strikes me that your government, you, you've already mentioned capital versus revenue. Uh, certainly, um, well, a couple of prime ministers ago, it's far more interested in larger uh, capital projects and revenue projects. Will you have enough money to franchise buses, do all, all the other, all the other uh, sorts of things that you really want to do on a regional basis? And with that, that was to our North East speakers, Peter? So, or... North, North East speaker, yeah, but yeah. I think it applies to other, other regions as well. Yeah. Mark, do you want to take that one, Mark or Alex? Transport isn't my um, isn't my specialism, but I, 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 what I would say is there is there is an ambition to um, to do to do that. I think part of the you know, part of the opportunity is that you know the the full to you know, full scope of resources that are needed to achieve that you know can be incrementally unlocked over time. I think we've uh, we've seen that with the current model of combined authority where the you know the effectively the down payment in investment fund terms or or transport settlement terms is really a baseline to build on and i think it's incumbent on you know on local leaders as jason says to make the make the fully rounded argument about why that's a, a good thing um back to you know back to whitehall to unlock any further resources that are needed but beyond that i i, I don't really have the me sort of fingers in the the detail of the of the mechanics of it really Thank jeremy you. can i yeah good can so go, go. Can I in on that one so um because bus franchising because i'm a really cool person is a real source of interest for me too and um, so i 
I think the really interesting thing about the franchising is even if you keep the amount of funding for public subsidy for the bus service neutral, that the benefit of devolving some of that money is not that you can have kind of more bus routes, but just that by bringing that together with the other levers that the combined authority might hold. So whether that's over uh, a tram system, if there is one locally, I know that in the Northeast, there are some kind of bits of a tram network, um, but also bits of rail that you can get much more out of much less. And then when you start bringing that together with your industrial strategy, with your planning powers, you can ensure that you're getting proper bang for your buck instead of a set of um, uh, Whitehall-based civil servants in the DFT planning your local bus services and then someone else, you know, so on and so forth. So um, I think there should be more investment and more money that goes towards bus services and local transport. But even if you hold it neutral, the benefit of local decision making is uh, is really key. Jason, would you want buses de uh, devolved in Reading? Uh, so, listen, very peculiarly, Reading never sold its bus company as one of only about eight that still owns their municipal bus company. So it's sort of OK for us. But looking not far afield, Slough, the services are an absolute mess and bus franchising is something that has been desperately desired there. If you look at Oxford, where you have a very competitive market, I mean, the, the lack of ability to rationalise some of these things is problematic. I can absolutely see that franchising, in the even in the absence of further funding, would allow for a much better public transport system. The missing link, quite often, I think, is, is the need for proper integration with rail and the way in which those systems do not interface very well with one another. I think Nottingham is the only place I've seen where they've managed to do quite a good job of bringing rail and bus together, even without the formal devolution of powers. It's very impressive what they've managed to do there. Thank you, Jason. I think you often see in other European countries that the integration of bus and rail is much superior to that in, yeah. in the UK. And I think we maybe have lots to learn from that. Um, I'm going to go now to a comment in the chat, and I'll throw this up to anyone on the panel, which is from, um, from Chloe, Chloe, which is, what are the community level based benefits of such devolution? Do you think that in areas of conflict or with legacy issues, de devolution may actually be counterintuitive to positive community relations, particularly with neighboring areas or communities? Anybody take that one? To some extent, it depends on how it how it's done, I think would be would be the answer. I think if you if you think about the status quo of um relatively place blind um interventions and investment um without devolution, then postcode lotteries exist variability in service exists um you know the, the the status quo the baseline position is um is is relatively clear as as we as from where we start i think what we've done at the north of Tyne level um is to move a little bit more into that core design space into a, a bit more of a participatory democracy space so we've you know we've held citizens assem assemblies on climate change you know we've got a, a an elected mayor who is you know very focused on um, core design uh, with residents and with communities we've taken hyper approach hyper local approaches to to community development in terms of high street recovery to the to the scale that we're able to invest in these initiatives and you know the the, the key challenge here is that the quantum of resources available to co to any combined authority um, given that they tend to exist in areas of highest deprivation is is a is a key limiter on the ability of us uh, of, of, of for us to be able to intervene. But we have taken a deliberate approach to a blended set of investment that aren't purely focused on big capital investment or you know development of office infrastructure, but is you know equally balanced with you know community driven crowdfunding initiatives, supporting community beekeeping, and a range of other things, which actually you know attract some neg negative publicity as well as good because there are different views of how strategic a combined authority should be and the type of initiatives that should be involved in but i think we've done a reasonable job of you know balancing the big ticket strategic with the um you know the the community level impact can always do better but i think you know the, it's always a line that needs to be needs to be sort of trod really good alex yeah, just I was just going to mention just to follow up from what Mark said, and I, I won't repeat a lot of the points that he's made, but um, I think again he's right. It it depends how you, how you do it basically, um, and the beauty of this stuff is that you get to decide how you do it. Um, 
I just wanted to mention North of Tyne in particular. So they have um, an inclusive economy board, which I actually think has been super successful in terms of bringing in particularly like the voluntary sector. Um, so representatives from the from the voluntary sector and not just from businesses, not just from established partners who sit on that board and meet regularly and bring issues to the board and are able to contribute to the solutions that it finds or the work that it does. And um, that's only one one example but I think it's a really good example of actually um, what North of Town have been able to do which actually local authorities tend to not really have the resource or the capacity to be able to do in that way on such a regular basis um, but the other the other point that I would make is also that actually you know the combined authority or, or a devolution deal isn't it's not a silver bullet and it's not going to solve all of the problems um, but I think like I said earlier it is a starting point particularly for building up partnerships, um, which may not have existed before, but the local authorities still have a really big role to play, particularly on that on that more granular, real community-based um, sort of work. And just on the point about um, sort of counterintuitive, I think, um, again, there's always a, a risk of that in these things. And I think we saw it in the negotiations for the North East deal that actually, you know, it while we think it's very positive there's always people who are going to see downsides to it and maybe don't want it and i think across a whole region the northeast is one in particular where people have a real strong sense of identity not just regionally but in their own little pockets of areas and so it, it, there can be a tension there which is you know actually well why why do i want to be governed by some extra layer of bureaucracy um why can't my local yeah area just do this um so there's always going to be that tension but i think it's about um it is about how you implement it and i think um yeah it's a it's a long-term thing that will grow it's not the destination it's just the start of things i think great thanks for that um we're near the close but i want to bring in um uh, jason uh, and jason and uh and and uh, adam sorry in one more time before we go so final thoughts and jason um, jason particularly if, if you what would you want devolution in Reading, what would that look like if you wanted it? Wow, I would love devolution. <laughs> nice uh, particularly, quick. particularly, I would be keen that we would have devolution of education budgets and skills training. I think there's a lot we could do with that that is not being achieved in the current setup. Great. And Adam, final thoughts. Um, I just think that. You know, definitely we need more devolution and if we can get more mayors across the country, but also more powers to local authorities and to neighbourhoods, to the previous question on communities, we need far more kind of double and triple devolution, getting powers down to the lowest possible uh, level. And actually that's the role that combined authorities can play. They can be conduits for power to go from central government all the way down to individual neighbourhoods. And so I'm hoping that that's the next phase of this evolution. Great. OK, thank you, everyone, very much. Thanks for the great discussion of fascinating presentations. Um, this has been Ipsitis Event on Place and Spatial Inequality. I'd like to thank the speakers, Alex Jarvis, Mark Stamper, Adam Hawksby and Councillor Jason Brock. And please join us at another Ipsitis Event soon. Thank you all very much and goodbye. <laughs>